now we're shifting gears, right? We're going to talk really briefly about some specific disorders. We talked about aphasia syndromes last week. Sure. Any follow-up questions about communication, language skills? We're going to switch now and talk about developmental disorders. Some of the lecture content today will differ a little bit from the textbook, and I'm not going to talk as much about some diseases that are in the textbook. Uh, I'll leave you to read about those. I'm happy to talk about them and answer questions, but I'm going to focus on the developmental ones today uh, and add in a little bit of thought about some other developmental disorders that are, that are not as covered in the book. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about neurological disease, I think, uh, acquired neurological disease the next time. Uh, okay, so developmental disorders. So today I want to switch and emphasize some disorders that can be understood neurodevelopmentally. We've actually talked about some of these already, uh, because dyslexia, for instance, falls in this category. It's, an, it's a developmental, developmental dyslexia is a developmental disease, a disease of the growing nervous system, or the growing brain, more particularly. <laughs> And so here we're interested in diseases that have to do with abnormality and brain development. Uh, and that could be abnormality and brain development that's triggered by the environment. An example of that would be something like uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. It could be an abnormality of the brain that's primarily triggered by genes. Uh, and so that would be something like, uh, like MR or, uh, and then some things that are triggered by both genes and in the environment, like autism most likely is. Um, and I also want to mention that uh, this is a potentially informative concept, neurodevelopmental disease, not just for psychiatric disorders like ADHD or autism, but also for some disorders that we call neurological and not psychiatric, like epilepsy. Um, and as I'll mention later, when, when you talk about seizure disorders, um, there's a, a knowledge questionnaire that I used in my dissertation that had to do with knowledge and attitudes about epilepsy. Um, and the idea was that people uh, who know more about the disorder that they have are more likely to have positive attitudes about it and are also more likely to be able, willing and able to comply with um, the medical requirements of managing their, their disorder. Um, the first question on that was, was true or false that epilepsy is a mental illness? And in the sense that um, psychiatric disorders primarily affect mood, emotion, and motivation, epilepsy is clearly not a mental illness. Um, but in the context that it's a disorder that's somehow related to bad character or doing something wrong, not only is epilepsy clearly not a mental illness, but none of the other things are really mental illnesses either. Um, and so I do want to mention, though, that you know, there are some disorders that are neurological in the sense that the factors that are affected are not primarily uh, cognition, emotion, or motivation. Uh, and epilepsy is a good example of a neurodevelopmental disorder that primarily affects other neurological functions, uh, particularly like consciousness and, and, uh, and um, uh, alertness, uh, but also motor functions and things like that. But actually, many epilepsies do affect cognition, and they also affect emotion and motivation. And then there are non-psychiatric uh, kind of symptoms associated with uh, some psychiatric disorders. So anyways, the psychiatric neurological distinction, not a great one, uh, but sometimes useful. So one thing to understand about neural development, first of all, is that different parts of the body and brain and the nervous system develop at different times. Um, this is an old, oldie but a goodie, but this talks about the embryonic period, the fetal period, and the full term. So marching all the way down to the right side here where um, we're looking at um, uh, somewhere in the 37, 38 weeks kind of range being full-term birth. Um, and so day one of your life is here, and then going all the way back to conception. Um, it's important to note that in going from the single cell organism to the multi-cell, very complex organism, some things develop early, some things develop late, and some things are developing all the way through. Um, so for instance, um, the central nervous system is obviously developing all the way through, because one of the really early steps is neurulation that we talked about, the conversion <coughs> of the, um, the, the single cell organism into a neural tube. So the central nervous system is there from the beginning, and in fact it drives the development of a lot of other things. But it has some critical development later uh, in um, gestation. In contrast, some things are really not developing until later uh, time. So for instance, the heart doesn't really start until the third week. Um, and some things are much later, so like the teeth and the external genitalia. Here we're talking about uh, 
one to two months into gestation. Um, so that's when things are developing. But the central nervous system is kind of developing all the way through. So the second thing you want to ask is, um, what's going on with the central nervous system during those phases of development? And for that matter, what's going on after birth? Because as you probably realize, the central nervous system is continuing to develop substantially after birth. Uh, so this is a picture that talks about some of those things. Uh, and here we've added to the prenatal period the postnatal period. So here are the nine months of gestation. And then here is up to about 10 years. So right in the very beginning, you have the creation of the neural tube. And then you have the radial glia, which are the seeds that draw neurons out into their place in the nervous system. And so the development of neurons and glia happens um, all up until about the second year of life. Uh, they form in, they migrate, and they form into the brain and spinal cord. That happens a little bit later. You need neurons first, and then they migrate. And then some aspects of migration happen later. And so, for instance, the cell wall <coughs> gets populated um, fairly late in the game. Um, uh, I'll point out some of these things. So different kinds of synapses are also forming at different periods of time. So for instance, hippocampal synapses, which are important in learning, are happening during gestation, like in the second trimester. But then the association cortex is primarily uh, developing connections after birth. Uh, and then finally, myelination. So uh, this is the wrapping of the, the insulating uh, surround around the white matter bundles. Uh, and so, um, Myelination is important for conduction efficiency, if you remember, the saltatory conduction, the nodes of Ranvier from the, the midterm exam. This is important for fast, uh, reliable communication. And so all the big trunks, uh, trunk lines that are communicating information in your brain are going through myelinated fibers. And you see that a lot of that is actually happening post-birth. And in fact, it's happening out into, into childhood. Uh, and so here, the reticular formation, for instance, which is important in alertness, the association cortex. The association cortex was still actively being formed after birth uh, and, and connected. The myelination is obviously going to happen late. Um, and in fact, um, that actually continues much later than this graph, sh this picture shows. So if I summarize some, of, some key points from this discussion of the phases of neural development, First of all, proliferation <coughs> is an important phase, and proliferation means the creation of uh, neuro neurons, uh, and then also their, their placement via radial glia. And so this process of creation and, and migration of neurons uh, runs from uh, the prenatal period through about three years of age. And most of that migration happens during the second trimester, but some of it is postnatal, and the cerebellum was an example of that. Um, synapses are grown through about age two. And pruning, which means you start actually with too many neurons and too many synapses, pruning gets rid of one connection that you don't need. That's actually happening between about five and 20 years of age. Meaning, rather than continuing to form, just continuing to form new connections over time as you need them, you actually start with too many connections. The connections that are not useful get pruned out. Um, so one example of this would be that um, uh, infants uh, of all languages make similar sounds, but as you probably know, and as we talked about a little bit, I think, last week, different languages have different sounds in them. Some languages have a large number of sounds and tones. Some languages have a very small number. Um, like, for instance, I think Japanese only has 40 or 50 sounds altogether. Um, so, uh, during that toddlerhood phase, uh, you Learn, you're able to make all those sounds, whether or not they're, they're used in your language. But the sounds that are not used in your language uh, get pruned out. And they become harder to accurately and faithfully make in the way that a native speaker makes them because uh, these initial connections that allow for all those different sounds, some of them are lost. Um, so some connections, particularly in the deep white matter associated with the frontal lobe, go well into the 20s. And this is important because this white matter is really closely involved in frontal executive functions. Things like response inhibition, divided attention, planning, set shifting, uh, that are going to be really relevant to the disorders that we're going to talk about today. So it's an, a key piece of information that white matter is really being co-created well into the 20s. Um, 
multiple, so for many of you, for instance, in this room, you're still uh, developing myelination fully uh, at this point in your life. So multiple phases may be implicated in a disorder, but when you're shopping for an explanation of why something happens, you should be asking yourself if the phase of development that's correlated <coughs> that in which the, the pathology is present is correlated with a symptom onset pattern. <coughs> so let me explain what I mean by that. Um, we talked about things happening at different phases. For instance, association cortex myelination is happening here postnatally, um, and particularly during childhood and not even during toddlerhood. So if you have a disease that is immediately visible at birth, for instance, just hypothetically, this is a lousy explanation for why that disease happened. Uh, it's a chicken and it's a, it's a horse before the cart kind of problem. The disease couldn't have been caused by something that happened later in development, right? It has to be caused by something that happened before in development. So similarly, um, kids with autism have excessive neural connectivity during childhood, which suggests that pruning is not occurring uh, adequately in these children. However, pruning happens between about 5 and 20, and autism is clear at 12 to 18 months in some kids. So how could something that is supposed to happen at five years old explain something which is already evident in 12 months old? So all I mean by that is pruning is clearly abnormal in kids with autism. It's probably not an explanatory factor, or else there is an underlying factor that causes autism and causes abnormal pruning, but it's not the pruning itself that causes the autism because it happens too late to explain the problem in those children. Does that make sense? So you're going to be looking for things, and as you think about these disorders, and if you take an interest in one of these, you should be looking for things that make sense with them. For instance, pruning, which happens in the 5 to 20 age range, might make a lot more sense for ADHD than for autism. ADHD is often um, quite evident um, around 7, 8 years of age. There's a study that says that if you intervene for, uh, for ADHD with medications by fourth grade, you show fairly consistently improved uh, academic outcomes. Uh, lots of kids can skate through the first couple years of school without any kind of treatment or accommodations for ADHD um, just because they're smart. And, uh, and so that, a disorder that's not really clearly evident until five, six, seven years of age, that might be caused by pruning, but a disorder like autism that um, was already there before the pruning phase uh, is probably not caused by pruning, although pruning could be explained by a common underlying pathology. Okay. Enough about that. So let me apply some of that knowledge here and there to a handful of disorders that are developmental in nature. So we talked about autism spectrum disorders already. <coughs> uh, you know, by virtue of what I told you about myself, this is a topic area that I'm really interested in, uh, but I'm not spending that much time on in this class. So just as a brief refresher uh, from the first discussion, autism spectrum disorders are defined by a triad of symptoms, uh, three kinds of problems, deficits in functional verbal communication, that could range all the way from not talking to not being able to handle um, uh, non-literal or ambiguous aspects of speech, like humor uh, or slang. Uh, deficits in functional nonverbal communication, so that's monitoring and producing of things like body language uh, and facial affect uh, and gestures. And then restricted or repetitive behaviors or interests, which could range all the way from things like rocking or flapping to very high-level things like uh, just uh, uh, highly focused interest in one specific area that without a lot of interest in anything else or odd patterns of interest in normal activities like my example of the kid who uh, could draw every NFL football helmet but couldn't explain anything about what football was or why it was fun. So functional verbal and nonverbal communication restricted or repetitive behaviors or interests uh, and in the DSM-5 this is changing slightly these two are basically being crunched into one deficit in functional communication. And then this one, what they're talking about is adding as a second component to this the sensory abnormalities, which are probably related. Things like unusual responses to temperatures, um, unusual pain responses, <coughs> unusual responses to textures or sounds. So that may end up being added as a criteria. It's been something we've known about for autism a lot for a long time that we haven't considered a diagnostic criteria. So, the current uh, definition scheme for autism allows for three diagnoses, three primary diagnoses, autistic disorder, 
which just means that you have these things and you have delayed milestones in language. Asperger's disorder, meaning that you don't have any delayed uh, delays in development, you have a normal IQ, whereas here, you could be delayed and then catch up and have a normal IQ, or you could be delayed and stay delayed, um, but you did have a delay, at least in childhood. And then finally, pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, uh, which essentially just means that you have these three areas that are developmental in nature that don't have any other explanation, but the pattern doesn't crystal clear fit the autism pattern. And then there are also some specific syndromes, like Rett's disorder and childhood disintegrative disorder. Um, and there's a whole host of uh, uh, syndromal conditions that are known to cause autism or autism-like features. So examples of that are things like tuberous sclerosis uh, complex. Um, and then there's a variety of, of syndromes also that cause things that are loosely like autism, but if you ask an autism expert, don't really look exactly like autism. So that'd be things like Angelman's syndrome. Um, so autism is clearly neurodevelopmental. Uh, in, in the classic cases, it can be just, uh, identified during that first year of life. And many, in some cases, more than a few cases can actually be reliably diagnosed by 18 months. And almost all the cases can be reliably diagnosed by four or five years. So it's clearly neurodevelopmental in the sense that these symptoms are clearly there very early on. Uh, and so most likely, whatever is happening that explains autism is either happening prenatally or very, very early postnatally or af right after the birth. Um, on the other hand, there is no single gene that explains <coughs> a large number of cases of autism. And so it's not a simple genetic explanation, and so a lot of it is probably gene-environment interactions. And a lot of that is not really well understood. I think I mentioned during the discussion the last time that there's a study that said that if you live within a certain distance of an interstate, uh, but not a busy road like 28th Street, uh, you're at higher risk for having a child with autism. Uh, and that's presumably due to pollution, but we don't exactly understand what that means. It's a, kind of a strange piece of data. So we think that there most likely are environmental factors, probably things like pollutants, um, or something in food, or uh, other things that we ingest, um, rather than the kind of environmental factors that have to do with bad parenting. For the most part, we don't think that those are um, explanations. So the original model of autism was a biological disease, and that came from Canner, and it was first described in the 1940s. Um, although observations later noted that some symptoms were mimicked in extreme environmental conditions, uh, like concentration camp survivors, who clearly didn't have a developmental disease uh, because they were developmentally normal before uh, that, uh, that really terrible event. Uh, and actually, neglected orphans are another good example. A high number of them have symptoms that look something like autism, some of which get better over time and some don't. And so this stuff, to some extent, legitimately raised a concern over an environmental component and at that time, the idea of the environmental component was that it had something to do with uh, the kinds of emotional responses that <coughs> happened early in life, um, kind of along the lines of attachment theory. So for instance, in attachment theory, you talk about things like uh, children who are given uh, immediate and consistent soothing when they're upset, develop things like a secure attachment style. Then later in toddlerhood, they're willing to play and explore far away from parents. And if parents leave and come back, they're OK with the parents leaving or have a mild uh, frustration with that. And when they come back, they welcome the parent back. In contrast, children who are shown other kinds of, um, of emotional responses to their distress in infancy will do other things like uh, an approach avoidance kind of behavior, like uh, becoming overly upset when the parent leaves and then staying upset when the parent comes back and not being suitable, or um, even having a kind of undifferentiated response where they don't really even respond preferentially to the parent. So all of that, which is legitimate, um, was kind of modeled on autism. And for a while, early on, there was this idea that autism happened because the parent wasn't loving back to the child. The parent didn't show compassion, uh, didn't suit the child when they were upset. Uh, and those kinds of things, and then the child then lo essentially lost interest in pursuing social connection because in infancy, the purpose of these emotional social displays is to solicit care from the caregiver, and since that wasn't happening, then the child would stop doing it. But what it turns out is that 
the parents of kids with autism are just as warm and social uh, as parents of healthy controls. There is really no evidence that bad parenting is happening on any kind of consistent basis for these kids. And more particularly, there's no evidence that that bad parenting kind of model explains how these kids came to have autism. Uh, and so we still say that autism is largely a gene environment, meaning it's a mix of biology or nature and nurture. But what we're talking about with the environment is most likely things like the chemical environment prenatally and maybe in early infancy. We're probably not talking about the social environment just by virtue of how early these symptoms happen. And even by virtue of things like twin studies where two twins are um, not monozygotic but they're raised apart so they have different social environments with the same genes. Don't really suggest that these environmental interactions are of the sort that have to do with parenting style. Um, so, lending to the gene component is that concordance rates are very high in monozygotic twins, 70 to 90 percent, compared with something like 10 or 20 percent in dizygotic twins that share only half of their gene code, meaning that autism is a highly heritable condition. Uh, and in fact, I think I mentioned one statistic that uh, for a person who has a child with autism, uh, if you have another boy, you're like a one in four chance of having a the boy having autism. Uh, so it's highly heritable. Um, on the other hand, it's heritable via a large number of genes and gene combinations. Uh, currently, probably we can identify the gene combinations that are associated with about 25 to 30% of cases of autism, and the rest of them are unknown. It's the sort of thing where there's no one genomic pattern that explains a large number of autism cases. Uh, and so there are a whole <coughs> bunch of different genes that seem to have a all roads lead to Rome kind of effect, where you get the same phenotype with different genotypes. You get a different biological underpinning, but you get the same outcome, which is these two things. So, autism neuropathology. One thing that will be consistent with several of these disorders that we'll talk about today is that the gross examination of the brain is structurally normal. So I'm not going to show you a picture uh, you know, of, of the brain with the skull removed uh, to show you how you know, structures are in different places. The hypothalamus is in the same place it always would be. The precentral gyrus is in the same place it always would be. The gross structure, meaning the, the structure visible to the naked eye, is generally pretty much just the same as it is in anyone else. Um, however, clearly there is something different about kids with autism than kids without autism. And there are some subtle differences. There are some subtle gross differences, and then more particularly, there are some fine structure differences. At the gross level, the, path, the, the progression of development is different. So the brain's actually slightly smaller than normally developing peers at birth, but then it grows abnormally quickly during the two to three year old phase, meaning that during the late era of, migra of, um, of proliferation and migration, there's an abnormal number of cells and connections, and actually during uh, early childhood, uh, the brain's actually 10% larger than it should be. And then it slows down and by adolescence returns close to normal size. But growth remains poorly regulated. Uh, so for instance, during the toddler years, frontotemporal regions, temporal regions having to do with language and memory, frontal regions having to do with executive functions and motor control, these regions grow very slowly in kids with autism during the toddler years, maybe just by a few percent versus 20% improvement in increases in size in the normally developing children. So one story is that there's abnormal periods of growth and the size of the brain is different from that of other kids at different ages. But then even within the brain, although the growth structure is normal, some pieces grow a lot um, in kid, normally developing kids and don't grow as much in kids with autism, which means that the growth is happening somewhere else in the brain. Uh, because during this time, the brain's larger than those kids. And then finally, if you put all those things together, these subtle abnormalities indicate that one problem with autism is that there is hyperconnection at a local level, meaning kids with autism have lots of local linkages between neurons, more than their normally developing peers, but they have less of the global connections connecting one part of the brain with another. And what this may explain is that kids with autism learn in highly specific and non-generalizable ways. And so they learn very specific things like scripted routines to approach issues or um, 
responding exactly by echoing you rather than interacting verbally with you. Uh, they may learn how to solve a problem in one situation but not be able to solve it for a different person or in a different place. These local connections may explain that. Um, the lack of global uh, thinking may be related to the lack of global association networks. And one thing that's prominent about people with autism is that they show less interest <coughs> and or ability. And it varies. Some people have a lot of interest and not a lot of ability. Some people have a, have a fair amount of ability but a lack of interest. Um, and, and so, of course, some people have a lack of both. So people with autism show problems with interest and or ability in understanding thoughts and emotions of others. And that's something that we call theory of mind. So my ability to know what you're thinking and what you're feeling. The really simple example of that on the thinking side would be something like um, if there's a cookie jar here and you open it, you come in and you open it, there's spaghetti in the cookie jar, and you close the cookie jar. Now if your friend comes in and they look in the cookie jar, they're also going to think there were cookies in the jar just like you did. They're not going to know that there's spaghetti in the jar just because you did. Right? That's a really simple theory of mind problem. On the, um, on the uh, cognitive side, a really simple theory of mind problem on the emotional side um, might be uh, if you um, open the cookie jar and uh, you found that it was empty and there were crumbs, say, uh, on your desk, then I might look at you angrily and you should understand that I'm angry at you because you ate the cookies that I wanted. Right. So that's a more of an affective theory of mind problem. But emotionally or affectively, it has to do with understanding what other people are thinking so that you can model how they'll respond and also so that you can produce um, behaviors of your own that are likely to elicit the behaviors you want from them. That might sound kind of uh, uh, mercenary, but if you think about it again, the idea of communication and emotion, the laugh act and so forth, in infants is that these are survival mechanisms. Infants cry so that they'll get fed in, or get changed or whatever. And then as they start to talk, they talk in part because um, their speech output allows them to refine the help that they get, right? When they can talk, they can tell you that they're hungry, and so you'll feed them instead of trying to change them. But before they could talk, you had to go through all the different things that could be wrong. You could see maybe they need to be burped or changed or fed or given a drink. You don't really actually know what's wrong with them. So theory of mind is important in communication because you have to know that something about the other person's state so that you know that if you um, make requests, you will get predictable responses to them. This is something that people with autism don't do well. And theory of mind is related to what other people are thinking. And you've heard people say something like the idea that the eyes are the gateway to the soul. Well, the face is a really highly useful piece of information about what other people are thinking and feeling. And consistent with this, people with autism have underactivity of the fusiform face area the area we talked about when we talked about facial recognition, during things like facial affect recognition tasks. And so here you see a comparison of a control and a person with autism. And you see some structures that are involved in general information processing and structures that are involved specifically in processing of faces. And you see there's a lot less activation of this facial area in the people with autism. In fact, in this picture, hardly anything. So, There are abnormal connections. There's abnormal development of local regions. Uh, there are connections that are, un that are unusual. Too many of them exist in some contexts and too few in other contexts. One consequence is that some skills, skill areas are not invoked when they need to be. Uh, and in fact, there's some arguments that these skill, if you kind of cue the use of this kind of technique, the ability may be there, but it's not automatically used to solve the problem. One explanation of why this is happening is the extreme male brain theory or hypothesis. It's advocated for by Simon Baron Cohen in the UK. And um, he advocates that essentially um, the symptoms that exist in autism are hypermasculinization of some aspects of neurodevelopment. I mentioned this to you before we had the discussion, but now that you know a little bit about how masculinization works, you can think about this hopefully a little bit more critically. I mentioned before that the one obvious thing that didn't make sense about this was that, or that was a question mark, was that 
only certain things are hyper-masculinized and certain things are not. You know, like as an obvious or maybe even kind of crass example, um, men have more body hair than women, but kids with autism don't have more body hair than kids who don't have autism, right? They don't look physically male. Um, they don't have male sex organs. Um, they don't, they, lots of things about them don't, are not particularly masculinized. But some things are, and potentially in this argument. So in order for this to work, you have to figure out what it is that allows you to have some things be masculinized but not other things. But it's possible. I mean, we talked about already how masculinization is a two-step process, and there's crucial and different actions by different prenatal hormones during that. Um, and consistent with that, uh, autistic traits, not the diagnosis, but the traits, do correlate with prenatal testosterone exposure. So if you do an amnio and you measure testosterone levels in the amniotic fluid, uh, they're correlated with autistic traits. High testosterone, high autistic traits. And that's true in both boys and girls. And this is Ayung's study that's mentioned in the book. So that is one con possibly consistent thing. Um, it's possible that um, these symptoms are produced by a hypermasculinization. Although it's not really clear that prenatal testosterone exposure is the method of hypermasculinization, there's not really a lot of evidence that that is what causes autism. But what may be consistent is that when the masculinization does occur, you see the symptoms that you expect to see. And again, it's going to be really important for this theory to figure out why some things get hypermasculinized and not others. So that's autism. Um, we talked about it a little bit already. But if we put all the pieces together now, we see some things that we are informed by, uh, things like our study of reproductive development last week. Um, and also putting together a bunch of things like the way we recognize faces and the way what we know about how the brain develops. We see that um, there are different features of autism that can be explained by different aspects of development. So here, um, this early brain development is consistent. So if migration and proliferation are abnormal, that's something that wraps up by two to three years of age by the time that autism is visible. That, that's a much better candidate for why the autism came about. The lack of pruning is quite possibly a consequence. Yes? Um, with a hypermasculinization, I'm sure we've gone over this in okay. previously, but um, are, ma or are males more likely to have autism than females? Yes, they are, yeah. And um, as the book might briefly mention, um, peep, so there, autism is a, is a spectrum. On the severe end, there's severe, or there's, there is MR, there's developmental delay. Um, and in the severe end, there's extreme MR, kids who are very, very low functioning, even into adulthood. At that extreme end, where there's both the masculine cognitive phenotype and also the significant developmental delay, there's a, a smaller uh, predominance of men. It's like two to one. But then you get to the mild <coughs> end where it's just the hypermasculinization of the cognition, arguably, and no, no developmental delay. Then in, in Asperger's, for instance, that ratio actually increases. So it's like eight to one or 10 to one or something like that um, in the mild end. And that, again, is maybe consistent with all of this. Um, this, the idea of this hypermasculinization um, would explain, excuse me, it would explain um, uh, why um, why more men have this than women because there's less far to go essentially. Um, men in general are more masculine than women, and so you don't need to push them further so far in that direction to get them to the point where they look clinically like autism. Um, So, that's autism. Uh, let me talk about some, a couple other disorders. I'm going to mention some that are not in the book, I think. Um, and I want to talk about fetal alcohol syndrome, at least briefly. This is a really great example of one that is primarily environmental, as opposed to primarily genetic, right? Um, although, we've talked about the idea of diathesis and stress. We've talked about the idea of precipitating factors and predisposing factors. <coughs> you can have a genetic predisposition to al fetal alcohol meaning you could have a gene code that makes you more susceptible to the effects of fetal alcohol exposure, meaning that you would be more likely to develop FAS with a smaller exposure to alcohol. But in the absence of alcohol, you should not have FAS, right? And so it's, a, it's an environmental 
is an environmentally triggered disease. So fetal alcohol syndrome refers to the more extreme end of a broader umbrella of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. There's a little bit of controversy because identifying who has fetal alcohol exposure is a little bit tougher. The tricky thing about this is that a lot of these kids can't be, can't be differentiated from kids with ADHD, <coughs> except by the fact that there was alcohol drank during pregnancy. Uh, and ADHD is at a fair, has a fairly high base rate, with higher than autism. And so how do you know for sure that that child wouldn't have still had those symptoms without the alcohol? On the other hand, fetal alcohol syndrome um, has not only cognitive changes, but also um, developmental abnormalities in development of the body, and particularly of the face. Uh, and this picture shows some example of, examples of that. Some really prominent ones are um, the lack of the philtrum, this ridge that runs from the bottom of your nose to the top of your lip. Um, a thin upper lip is a, a really common characteristic, particularly the upper lip, a small <coughs> thing. Um, and then some things that, that are abnormal about the face and head that are seen in multiple disorders, like the flat mid face, that's seen in a lot of craniofacial disorders. Um, kids with cleft lips and palates often have flat mid faces also. Um, and uh, the low nasal bridge. Um, but so the, the filtrum, the thin upper lip, the low na nasal bridge, those are particularly um, characteristic of FAS. The palpebral pe fissures to some extent also. Um, that's the, uh, the, uh, the way that the eyelid looks. Um, so, fetal alcohol syndrome is characterized when you have the facial abnormalities in the context of fetal alcohol exposure. And, and this is going to happen with the more significant alcohol administration and also, um, uh, you know, potentially with, uh, with a higher predisposition to developing FAS based on the genes. So, um, brain structures involved in executive functions, prefrontal cortex, the cerebellum, the basal ganglia, the limbic system, um, so we talked about all of these before. Prefrontal cortex uh, is higher order cortex that is planning more complicated motor activities. Uh, it does a variety of um, executive functions, both hot and cold. So like the orbitofrontal cortex does emotional regulation. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex does things like divided attention. The cerebellum integrates plans and smooths them out, sort of like taking multiple moves and turning them into dancing or walking. And so the cerebellum does the same thing for cognition. It smooths it out so that uh, your cognitive processes are seamless. And uh, that's an executive function. That is going to be important in executive functions. The basal ganglia, which um, select, uh, inhibit, um, so they allow for you to think before you act, for instance, response inhibition, the limbic system with emotions and motivation. These are all vulnerable areas to prenatal alcohol meaning that prenatal alcohol exposure will differentially impact these areas. Um, and for that reason, you get frontal executive kinds of symptoms in FAS, which are exactly the same kinds of symptoms that you have in ADHD. Um, although in FAS, it's a primarily environmental cause, which is not the case in ADHD. So just to be clear about that, the kind of problems you have are things like not thinking before you act, a low frustration tolerance, uh, Difficulty divide, shifting attention between one task and another. Um, difficulty being flexible in your thinking pattern. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, I know, I think it was in one of my like, child development classes. I don't know if this was one, but they said that a lot <coughs> of um, like, diseases that you can get, like, is this something that can be more vulnerable like, to develop in the first trimester? Um, so, I think, if I remember the logic correctly, um, let's see what this is. I want to say that, so, okay, so that you can actually, it actually starts way at the, early at the embryonic phase, um, but uh, there are some important things that happen during the second trimester also. Yeah. I mean, the first trimester is an important point, though. Um, so, like, what, what you mentioned, one example where that's really true is, is spina bifida. In spina bifida, um, the problem happens early in the formation of the neural tube. And so the reason that they tell women um, who have any chance of getting pregnant uh, to take folic acid is because 
the problem is going to happen during the first trimester when you don't know you're pregnant. So you can't start taking the folic acid after you get pregnant. <coughs> right? That's okay. I was thinking because yeah. a lot of women like, don't know they're pregnant for a while mm -hmm. right. if they're drinking. Like, yeah. I was wondering if that would have... It's, it can. I mean, you should... I mean, you know, obviously the advice is that if there's any chance that you could have a kid, actually if you're a man or a woman and there's any chance you could have a kid, you're going to be drinking in moderation anyways, right? And small amounts of alcohol don't clearly disrupt uh, prenatal development. Um, and in fact, in Europe, women do drink um, fairly routinely during pregnancy, but they drink in very small quantities. Um, and it's not super clear that that's a problem, although generally in America, the advice is not to do that. Uh, the really, my understanding uh, uh, is that a lot of the really crucial things are going to happen during the second trimester, um, and that is actually um, related to things like, like the hippocampus and the reticular formation, like these things that are forming in the mid-pregnancy phase, um, and the, like those frontal executive kinds of structures are not even, they don't even exist in the first trimester, they're being developed later. And so that's part of the reason why some of the stuff, the later exposure can be just as serious. Um, but there are, as the book notes, even during the very, very early embryonic phase, which is um, the embryonic phase is here um, during the first trimester, there are definitely impacts of, um, of, uh, of fetal alcohol. Um, and complicating the picture is that there are probably some kids who just don't survive into pregnancy, where the pregnancy is spontaneously terminated really early as a result of the alcohol administration. And you don't count those kids because you don't know about them. Um, but kind of going back to this slide, this slide is useful for thinking about that. Things that go wrong in fetal alcohol syndrome, abnormalities of the formation of the ears, that was in the picture, of the eyes, of the teeth, a lot of this is happening here, right? And so this is, and, and then it, as it happens, certain aspects of the nervous system are also have, uh, being grown at this phase. And that's why those areas are the areas that are affected um, by fetal alcohol. And, and so a lot of, and, and as it happens, um, there's relatively less effects on things that are going on earlier. So like your arms, which are mostly developed by then, they're not really usually affected by FAS. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so, in terms of what people should do, you should be careful, obviously. And so, if there's any, like, so again, if there's any chance you could get pregnant, then you do want to avoid things that would be teratogens or things that would uh, cause a serious malformation in the pregnancy. Uh, and you want to do simple things that you can do as precautions, like taking folic acid, which um, reduces the chance of spina bifida. Um, but then. Obviously, I, mean, there are, I think realistically there are limits on what you can expect people to do um, when there's a relatively low chance that they would have a pregnancy. Um, so, just a, a few more things about FAS. Um, something that is important to think about with these frontal executive structures, alcohol blocks NMDA receptors. Uh, remember NMDA receptors were crucial in the long-term potentiation process that was important in learning and development of the brain. So withdrawal can actually also be an important part of what goes on in FAS. Because lots of people who are drinking go through phases where they're drinking and they're not drinking, especially heavy drinkers. Heavy drinkers who go on binges go through withdrawal by virtue of the fact that they have a high administration of alcohol, but they don't do that <coughs> constantly. When they're going through withdrawal, they can actually be causing overstimulation of NMDA receptors. And so this dysregulated uh, stimulation of these NMDA receptors, which are crucial for learning and formation of the brain through learning during development, um, can drive abnormalities in higher order brain development. Because that higher order brain development is based on associations between neurons, a lot of which is controlled via NMDA. So that's FAS. Um, and again, FAS does probably exist on a spectrum. Obviously, if you have a small amount of alcohol exposure, you have a small amount of alcohol exposure. The, the clear FAS symptoms are, are generally um, uh, experienced because of high levels of alcohol. Uh, it's a little bit less clear how big of a role the small levels of alcohol play. So, uh, mental retardation. So, MR, 
uh, is defined based on two things. One is a credible low IQ, and so I'm a neuropsychologist, so I have to emphasize that. Um, you can have a low IQ on a standardized test just because you don't try. You have to try your hardest. Um, and so the IQ has to be credible and has to be low. Um, IQs are distributed like a bell curve with 100 being in the middle. Uh, most people are between about 85 and 115. Um, generally speaking, MR is defined as an IQ with an IQ below 70. Um, and very importantly, the second thing is that the real world performance of the person has to correlate with the IQ. I mean, you can't just have a low IQ test. You also have to do poorly in real world self-care kinds of skills. You have to fail to develop the real world skills that other people develop. Um, and it has to be developmental in, in nature. And we're really talking about a failure to fully develop high level brain skills rather than a loss of them due to an injury. So, um, MR, people, people in, in psychology often just say MR. Um, the problem with this is there are a whole bunch of terms and there's been an exhaustive effort to try to find a term that's not pejorative to describe this condition. And the problem is they always become pejorative, unfortunately. Um, you will see a wide variety of things. DDE, or developmental delay, is commonly used as a synonym for this, although there are lots of different kinds of developmental delays. Um, so physicians will sometimes say something like static encephalopathy, meaning there, there was, encephalopathy means there's something wrong with the brain. Static means that something is constant over time. Uh, global cognitive impairment uh, is sometimes used. There are a few other terms. Um, I'll just say MR, if that's okay. That is the term that the DSM-IV uses. Um, the other concern about the term is that it is confusing. There's this old idea of cognitive age, like the idea that um, if you uh, are 10, but you have the skills of a five-year-old, then your IQ is 50, because you have half of what you're expected to have. The problem with that is that kids who have MR don't just develop on a slower trajectory. It's not like when they're 32, they'll have the skills of a normally developing 16-year-old. They also have the asymptote. They, they, they don't develop, even in the long term, some of those skills. So that makes the MR kind of term also somewhat counterintuitive. But what I'm talking about is, is a low IQ, which is developmental in nature, and which has uh, real world deficits that are associated with it, uh, and self complex self care skills. OK, so it varies in severity. So mild MR uh, might mean that you just, uh, you're able to read like a grade schooler. You're able to do a lot of simple tasks, but higher order things are hard to catch, like being able to balance a checkbook or um, file your taxes. Uh, you um, often with mild MR, with the right kind of help, you can live independently in the community. Uh, you may even be able to hold competitive employment, if not employment with some support. Um, moderate MR is going to be more significant. You may only have hundreds of words in your vocabulary, even in adulthood. You may um, uh, not be able to read or be able to read minimally. Uh, you're probably only going to have work in a sheltered kind of environment. And then as you go further down the line, severe and profound MR, um, you'll see more, also more physical deficits that are associated with a lack of development of the motor cortex. So things like um, lack of motor control, like control of the hands. Uh, and that's going to be more in severe and profound MR. Um, so there are a number of syndromic presentations of MR in a wide variety of known neurological disorders. So those are things like Down syndrome, where uh, there's trisomy, fragile X, uh, FAS that we just talked about. Um, so there's a bunch of things that where we know why the MR ha happened, but then there are also a lot of cases that are idiopathic. And what I mean by idiopathic is that the, the um, cognitive impairment is the only manifestation of the problem. And there's no real clear explanation of why the problem occurred. So you've got a person who just isn't able to complete as many of these thinking kinds of tasks as other people, but in every other respect, they're essentially normal. Um, that doesn't mean that it's normal. And so one thing to be very careful about is, I talked about this, this Gaussian kind of distribution for, um, uh, um, <coughs> this Gaussian distribution for IQs, right? And that Gaussian distribution predicts that even if you go really far out there, 
to a very, very high IQ or a very, very low IQ, if you have a large enough pool of people, there ought to be someone like that. That doesn't mean that just because the Gaussian distribution says that, that it's normal for people to fail to develop these cognitive skills. Um, we do think that there most likely is some kind of underlying cause that potentially can be limited or, or dealt with or minimized or mitigated. Um, and most likely that's a range of genetic and environmental factors. And like the case with autism, there's not just one single uh, cause of this, uh, but there's a whole host of things that could potentially be reduced that can each incrementally reduce the, the number and severity of people who develop MR. So one possible explanation of what's happening for those diverse reasons is uh, a pathology in the synapse. Because um, again, a gross examination, outside of some of those syndromal cases, in many cases, the brain's normal looking. Uh, in idiopathic MR, uh, an MRI of the brain is going to look pretty much just like anyone else's brain MRI. So one hypothesis is that, broadly speaking, MR is a constellation, is a synaptic deficit that's caused by a variety of deficits in development and regulation of the, the physical synaptic process. What I mean by that is there are a whole bunch of proteins that go into creating and maintaining and placing the synapse. We talked about things like how, um, how NMDA can be used to move uh, receptor channels onto and off of the synaptic cleft. So those processes go awry in MR. And one of the syndromic cases, at least, actually gives us a fairly good model of how that might work. And that's the Fragile X syndrome. So in Fragile X, um, the Fragile X genotype causes a failure to produce a protein, FMRP, uh, which acts inside the cell body, including in the dendrites, in response to metabotropic glutamate receptors. We talked about how um, there are, are at least three different kinds of glutamate receptors, one of which is metabotropic, um, that's, that allows for long-term uh, monitoring and changes, right? This is the slow-acting diffuse receptor, as opposed to the ionotropic receptor that, have, that has an immediate local action. So metabotropic glutamate receptors um, trigger the release of fMRP. And fMRP um, acts throughout the, throughout the cell, uh, in the nucleus, in the, uh, in the uh, dendrites, in various places, in the axon. And what it does is um, reorganizes inside the cell, and particularly in the dendrite, um, in response to synaptic activity. So this, glutam this metabotropic glutamatergic process is another way in which the synapse is morphologically altered as a result of activity. Uh, and in, in Fragile X, fMRP isn't produced, and this process is abnormal, leading to synapses that are abnormal. The brain on gross is normal, but the synapse is unusual. And so that's a possible explanation for what's going on with MR. It's at the fine structure level, at the neuron-neuron the -neuron connection level. So, that's, um, that's mental, that's an MR, and, uh, and that's a possible explanation, although again, there are probably many different kinds of explanations that for a variety of reasons all lead to this common set of deficits like in autism. Okay, so I want to talk about a few uh, milder disorders. Um, so autism <coughs> can be mild or severe. Uh, FAS and MR are fairly significant uh, for children who have them. Uh, ADHD can be fairly significant, but it's also often fairly easily managed uh, and something that people can do very well with. So ADHD is also a neurodevelopmental disorder, and it's a cluster of disorders that include symptoms of hyperactivity or impulsivity and or inattention. So the way that we diagnose ADHD right now, there's a primarily inattentive type. And this means you have to be told things several times to do them. Uh, you fail to complete things. You um, you, uh, people have to try really hard to get your attention and keep it. You don't stay focused on one thing. And then hyperactivity, impulsivity, these are things like blurting answers out, interrupting people, uh, running around and getting into things for little kids, acting before you think. Um, most kids either have just inattention or both hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. And so they call that uh, ADHD an attentive subtype and ADHD combined subtype. Um, <coughs> For note, in terms of the development of this, um, this, the hyperactivity, almost always gets better over time. And so when you have adult ADHD, 
It's very, very rare for hyperactivity to be a core symptom of adult ADHD. The attention and the impulsivity can be harder to tackle. Um, so, ADHD occurs developmentally. Symptoms are clearly visible during early grade school, and the current American criteria uh, require them to be visible by about seven years of age. Um, and it is important to note, though, that that may be in hindsight, because smart kids can get by. And oftentimes, it's around third grade um, that smart kids with ADHD get found out. So you might wonder why that is. Um, there's a few reasons. Uh, one of them is that in many states, including Michigan, third grade is the first year that you do standardized educational testing. Right? Like, this is a MEEP year. Um, another reason, and so that standardized testing is going to be more challenging for kids with attention problems. Another reason is because around third grade, you start to get homework assignments. And you also start to be expected to do more independent schoolwork in the classroom. And so all that stuff is going to make it more obvious if, if there's an attention problem. <coughs> so the course of ADHD is generally improving over time, particularly in the late teens and early 20s. And if I go all the way back, that again is a story that is consistent with this. So myelination continues into the 20s, right? It's something that happens a lot during the, the teen and 20s years. And that's, cons oops, that's consistent with ADHD. Um, so um, there's improvement in the late teens and early 20s. But maybe about 60% still show some symptoms in adulthood. Many of them don't need medication. I, I don't know the number offhand, but I think the number of people in adulthood who need medications for ADHD is a lot lower than that. Um, but there are some of those as well. Uh, many of them learn tools to get by uh, over the course of childhood. Um, things that build mental discipline. Uh, a lot of times it's, te it's team sports martial arts, those kinds of things can help build mental discipline. Group activities can help build mental discipline. Compensatory tools like um, planners and organizers uh, and those kinds of things. Um, but some people will need treatment or accommodations and things like that even in adulthood. And again, hyperactivity tends to improve more than um, the, the other symptoms. And so hyperactivity uh, as, a, as a result of ADHD is rare in adulthood. So the symptoms of ADHD are very similar to those seen in brain injuries that affect the prefrontal cortex. Um, all these frontal executive skills that we're going to talk about pretty constantly, planning, divided attention, response inhibition, set shifting, meaning being able to shift from one kind of task demand to another, like, um, like being able to stop playing because recess is over and get back to doing schoolwork, or being able to finish the math section of the school day and go on to history. Reward monitoring. Um, so kids with ADHD and brain injuries will have uh, abnormal responses to situations in which uh, their behavior is rewarded or not rewarded. So, in fact, many people argue that ADHD is essentially a disorder of frontal circuitry development. And basically what they argue is that that frontal circuitry is um, on a different trajectory. I don't know if you this in a lecture, but I this one really quickly. Uh, I draw this for patients a lot. If um, all of these frontal executive skills, can we kind of think of them developing over time? And, you know, like 18 years old is somewhere here. So you still have some development in adulthood, but these kind of level off, like if this is your uh, ability to problem solve. Um, if this is the average person, there's a range of normal, right? Like some people are going to be better than normal, some people are going to be a little worse than normal. That range tends to be large in early childhood. It tends to be relatively smaller in adulthood. So an example of that is that there are some kids who are outside of frontal skills. There's some kids at four who can read books, and there's some kids <coughs> at four who can't read letters. But it's very rare to see that kind of variability in kids who are 10, right? So if this is the average line, and this is the normal range, kids with ADHD are down here somewhere. And some of those kids, what happens with them is they're outside of the normal range in childhood, but then they basically have the same slope, but it's translated over here. And so eventually they catch up. And then in adulthood or, or teenager years, they're actually not very different from everyone else. That's many kids with, uh, with ADHD. Some kids with ADHD are going to be more like in adulthood, there's still a gap between them and um, 
and people who don't have ADHD. So you're gonna see a range, but that range in any event is getting better over time. Um, the symptoms may become more problematic at certain phases of life, like if at third grade you inject um, homework and independent schoolwork and standardized testing, then you may see a big problem because of the behaviors, whereas in second grade when none of those things were happening, you got away with it. In that kind of sense, it could get worse at third grade, but if the symptoms actually get worse, like if the focus is actually worsening over time, um, or the activity level is increasing over time, that's less likely to be ADHD. That's probably something else. So ADHD is essentially a disorder of frontal circuit development. Uh, and the frontal circuits get better over the course of childhood. And in some kids, pretty much normalize uh, to comparable to uh, controls. And in some kids, uh, never quite make it that far, but they improve over time. Um, yes? What's Traumatic brain injury. So yeah, injury due to like a physical hit to the head, like in a car accident. Um, so ADHD children uh, show unusual responses to reward situations. And this is the example the book gives. So what is happening here is the delay between response and reinforcement. So in general, immediate gratification is immediately gratifying, right? Like this is something that common sense tells you. Immediate rewards are highly motivating. Long-term goals are harder to perceive reward from. And so for everyone, the shorter the, de the, res the delay between response and reinforcement, the stronger the reward motivation is. However, with kids with ADHD, that curve, the slope, is essentially shifted. And so what's happening with them is that for very, very short rewards, we're very, very short delays between response and reinforcement. They're extremely um, reinforced. And what that means is they're extremely motivated to respond very quickly, to try to get a short delay reinforcement. And that means that they think before they act. In contrast, after some kind of crossover here, for longer delays, they actually have less reinforcement by reward than other kids. Uh, and so, um, What's going on here is that they're not responding in a normal way to reinforcement. There's a distribution of this reinforcement delay in natural situations. Kids with ADHD are over-responding to those ones that have very short delays. This may also explain things like um, kids with ADHD, almost any parent in one of these children will tell you that they can focus for certain kinds of things. Like they can watch highly stimulating cartoons for a couple hours and stay glued to the TV where they can play Xbox 360 for a couple hours without skipping a beat. And the reason is probably because these things have very short reinforcement stimuli, uh, delays. They're really highly reinforcing, right? Like um, if you watch, especially if you watch modern kids' TV shows, they've just become more and more refined over time. Uh, there's one that they play, that we play in our lobby of my sender, and, uh, and it's, it's almost like it's obnoxious to me how reinforcing it is because it's so loud and it's so exciting that I get a headache just listening to it. But for kids, it's extremely rewarding with very short delays, and that really works for kids with ADHD. And so that's why they're able to respond in that situation. But you give them a more boring or slow reinforcement task like the ones you see normally in school, and they're not responding to the reinforcement. So treatment for ADHD. The most common medication treatments because you can do a lot more with medications for ADHD than for FAS or, or autism or MR. The most common treatment is our stimulants, and stimulants are dopamine reuptake inhibitors. Um, so uh, that's things like Concerta and Adderall, uh, methylphenidate, uh, Ritalin. Uh, so those things are all stimulants. Uh, but also there are some other options. Uh, there's a drug called adamoxetine or Stratera. It's a not norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Norepinephrine, remember, closely related to dopamine, um, via an enzymatic transformation. Um, and this SNRI also has an evidence basis in ADHD. Uh, and some SNRIs are used in adults on ADHD also, um, including this one, but also some <coughs> other ones. And then finally, some adrenergic agents, um, which are blood pressure drugs, like guanfacine, uh, are also helpful, although they're primarily adjunct. <coughs> 
What that means is you primarily use this stuff alongside the stimulants. Um, so there are medication treatments that have been shown to be effective. And that, as I mentioned, there's a study that was done this year in Sweden that suggested that if you do this before fourth grade, you tend to have fairly um, consistent replica replicable um, educational benefits. But you want to do this relatively early. You don't want to wait until sixth or eighth grade for this. Uh, and the logic of that is probably not a really complex neurological argument. It's simply that it's the same kind of argument that says why um, if you put money in your retirement account at 30, it does more for you than if you put it in your retirement account at 64, because it has a long time to accumulate, right? So if you learn in third grade, getting ahead at that age is huge in terms of your later education. Just like preschool education is clearly really important, because if you can gain a lot of ground there, it becomes less and less likely that you'll do poorly in school. So you want an early intervention just for good outcomes in education generally. Um, there are also some non-medication tools. And neurofeedback, uh, which essentially has to do with uh, measuring EEG brain waves, like the ones we talked about in the sleep lecture, um, so that alpha and beta activity for waking, right? Um, neurofeedback has to do with um, basically measuring brain activity, especially frontal lobe brain activity, and doing exercises that cause the brain activity to change, and then using your learning of how the brain activity changes to teach yourself to put yourself in a brain state. So it's very similar conceptually to biofeedback. <coughs> like in biofeedback, what you might do is you might wear a heart rate monitor. The heart rate monitor tells you whether your heart is beating 60 beats a minute or beating <coughs> 20 beats a minute. When you're anxious or upset, your heart rate is fast. Um, when you're relaxed, it's slow. The more you know what your heart rate is, because most of the time if you don't stop to check it, you don't know what it is, the more you can teach yourself to have a low heart rate. When you have a low heart rate, you're relaxed. Um, similarly, when you put your brain in this state, then you're focused. And so neurofeedback has been shown to be effective. Uh, and some studies even suggest it's as effective as medications. Um, and uh, so there are some non-pharmacological tools that affect ADHD. Um, and the idea of the stimulants, though, is kind of interesting and strange if you stop for a second. So stimulants, um, improving hyperactivity in particular might seem kind of odd, right? Like if you think about what happens to you when you drink too much caffeine, um, it certainly wouldn't make you less hyper, right? But if you think about yourself having a small amount of caffeine, like your morning coffee or a soda when you're studying, it can actually improve your concentration and focus. And so um, what happens is probably this inverse U-shaped relationship and that has been shown to be true for stimulants in not people without ADHD. So in small amounts, they give you, uh, <coughs> um, in small amounts, they give you a boost. Your, your focus is getting better. But then at some point, uh, it stops being true. And then at large amounts, eventually, you can actually have a negative effect. Um, and so basically, uh, too little dopamine, and you don't focus well. Uh, but too much dopamine, and you also don't. And um, there is actually a known uh, 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 enzyme, uh, COMT. Uh, and COMT codes for uh, enzymatic deactivation of both dopamine and norepinephrine. Again, remember, Stratera acts on norepinephrine. Uh, and COMT, which acts on deactivation of these, comes in these two variants. And um, there's a variant uh, that makes um, the, uh, excuse me, there's a variant that makes uh, um, dopamine available a lot, um, that doesn't get rid of it effectively. And um, in that variant, where there's lots of dopamine available, amphetamine doesn't really help reduce, improve performance errors, so low is better. It doesn't, it actually is worse. Uh, in this high dopamine case with the met met allele, administering the stimulant makes performance worse instead of better. The Val-Val allele is efficient at getting rid of dopamine, so there's a low dopamine level. In that one, performance improves dramatically when you administer the stimulant. And this does kind of rent, lend some credence to this, because these people with the met, met allele are likely to already have high dopamine levels, whereas the people with the Val-Val allele are likely to have low dopamine. 
So that's ADHD. Um, again, the symptoms are these frontal executive symptoms like problems with planning and response inhibition. Um, and those problems, again, are kind of common to multiple disorders, TBI, uh, and then as you'll see in a moment, OCD and Tourette's and tics. So well, let me mention uh, tic disorders uh, next. Um, these, again, are relatively, in many people, milder compared to things like MR. Tics are not fully controllable. Um, a lot of people use this term, involuntary, uh, to describe them. Motor or vocal actions. And what I mean by involuntary is you can, to some extent, inhibit them, but when they're happening, they're not happening under sort of called conscious control, meaning, like, if I reach for this to grab it, I can stop my hand easily at any time during that process. Once the tick is initiated, it's hard to stop. It, it basically happens automatically during the tick, but you can do some things before the tick to prevent it from happening. So there are two kinds of ticks, motor and vocal. Motor ticks can include things like twitching, uh, eye blinking, facial grimacing, head jerking, tensing of the abdomen. So it doesn't just have to be the face, it could be or the head, it could be the abdomen as well. And then vocal ticks can include things like clearing the throat, sniffing, coughing, and words or partial words. And the really um, infamous one is that in some cases at Tourette's, um, people have a really hard time inhibiting very automated words like curse words, and so they'll, they'll spontaneously um, swear. Uh, Tourette's is a disorder that's just characterized by both of these. So if you have motor and vocal tics together, then that's Tourette's syndrome. But in addition to motor and vocal tics, frequently, People with Tourette's also have subclinical ADHD and obsessive compulsive problems. Um, and I'm going to talk about obsessive compulsive disorder next. And these are, so these are all kind of linked because the cognitive issues are a lot like ADHD and the emotional issues are a lot like OCD. Um, there are some possible sex differentiation. In particular, boys more commonly develop tics, <coughs> and girls more commonly develop OCDs. Um, in general, if tics are a physical or motor behavior, you could kind of classify it as externalizing, meaning it's a physical activity in the outside environment, whereas OCD is more of an emotional or internalizing problem. And generally, externalizing behaviors happen more in boys, and internalizing issues happen more in girls. It might be, might be a common, consistent theme. Um, tics are also more highly prevalent, though, in other developmental disorders, and so in autism and MR, um, they're frequently ticks, and some people don't really think that they're uh, separate comorbidities in most cases in those diseases. And we deal with this with some of our low-functioning kids with autism, where they have things that look like ticks, and it's a question about whether there's really something new going on or not. Um, Tourette's follows a developmental pattern, uh, very much like um, ADHD. So the onset is generally in childhood. It improves over the course of adolescence and even into the 20s and 30s. And that dovetails with the development of white matter pathways, just like in ADHD. Uh, and the tics can vary substantially in severity. And in some cases, they can be fairly legitimately impairing. But in many cases, um, tics are not really impairing. Uh, and just promoting social societal tolerance is enough. Uh, and the disease doesn't really impact quality of life very much. And so Tourette's is really on a wide continuum, although that's true for some of these other disorders like um, Asperger's. Um, <coughs> Mild tics can be you know, something that you can deal with quite easily. And just telling people that they exist and that they're not a big deal may be enough to really resolve the problem. So another interesting point is that some medications, particularly the adrenergics, um, like guanfacine, that were helpful in ADHD are also helpful in tic disorders um, and actually also helpful in autism. Um, and Possibly what relates all of this together is that the, the adrenergic agents preferentially bind um, to alpha-2 A receptors, um, and they, those alpha-2 A receptors enhance prefrontal functionality, uh, and prefrontal issues uh, abound in all of these disorders. Um, and so this may be the underlying explanation of why that blood pressure drug actually improves uh, mood and behavior. So OCD. Uh, OCD is a psychiatric disease. It's characterized by obsessions and or compulsions. And the reason I bring it up is a lot of cases of OCD are also developmental in nature, uh, although it is possible to have OCD show up later. Uh, and OCD obsessions are repetitive, aversive thoughts. 
um, commonly having to do with things like fear or disgust. So they could be things like fears of contaminating uh, others or being contaminated, fear of something terrible happening or doing something terrible to others, uh, fear of deviations from symmetry. Um, so some of these things are normal. Like lots of little kids will um, try to walk in such a way that they never walk over the, cra the, the lines in the tiles or the sidewalk. Um, if that goes away, if it doesn't really impair you, it's probably not an obsession. Uh, but a much more substantial version of that, you know, like like having to um, to only buy things in threes or something like that might be more of an obsession. Um, a lot of times, too, these are really unrealistic. Uh, and so, for instance, uh, the things that you're that you are afraid will contaminate you are things that really have no likelihood of it contaminating you. You might have a fear of doing something terrible happening, like. Um, if you ever, you, you, probably most of you drive, um, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but every once in a while when I'm driving, um, particularly like if I'm driving on a road with one of those rails, I think, you know, it's really easy for me to stop turning the car along with a curb, and the car would go off the road, and I would be killed. But I also know that it's very unlikely that I would do that, right? Um, that doesn't actually happen. Um, just like if you're sitting at a stoplight, you don't just suddenly slam on the gas and run a person over. But you might have a really substantial fear with recurrent obsessive thoughts um, that you would do such a thing, uh, even rather than a passing thought that such a thing could happen. Compulsions are repetitive behaviors. <coughs> they often are things like counting, checking, cleaning, and also avoidance behaviors. And they're done often to avoid or mitigate the consequences of a rule violation. So for instance, um, if there's a possibility that something is not symmetric, uh, then you would go through a ritual, essentially, to address the fact that it's not symmetric. Or you'd go through a ritual to prevent yourself from contaminating people. Um, and it's important to note that these things occur with sufficient frequency and or intensity to really significantly impair adult life role, or impair life roles. And what I didn't mention on this slide is they should be outside the context of normal culture. So these shouldn't be rituals or obsessions that people in your culture normally have. Uh, and the book has a great example of that somewhere uh, about a religious uh, ritual um, that could look like OCD behaviors, but could be completely normal in a different culture than our own. At least in adults, uh, and at least at times, there's pretty good reality testing, meaning the person knows that this stuff is irrational and that they're doing it, and they're still doing it. Um, that doesn't mean that just because they know it's irrational that they'll stop doing it, um, but it does mean that they're aware of that concept. So, as I said, many of these OCD issues are related to things that you do normally. Like, it's normal to groom yourself. It's normal to check the locks on your house to make sure the house is locked. It's normal to clean. <coughs> uh, it's normal to be vigilant to danger. Um, but there are exaggerations of these normal behaviors. Uh, and there are other disorders that are maybe conceptually linked. Like trichotillomania is a disorder where you pull hair out repetitively. Again, grooming yourself is a normal behavior. Uh, grooming your hair is a normal behavior, but trichotillomania is an exaggeration of the normal behavior. And these cleaning and grooming and, and vigilance rituals can be exaggerations of normal behavior also. But it's important to remember that ritual is a common part of everyday life. Here's a couple of random examples. Uh, when I went to high school, I knew guys who were football players who would never wash their shirt, their jersey, but the night before a game. Right? That's a ritual. That's clearly irrational. But who cares, right? They don't wash their shirt before the game. No harm done. Um, there are lots of people who play their lucky numbers, like they play their, their birthday uh, as their lottery ticket, right? Again, irrational. You don't have any ability to control your ability to win by choosing specific numbers. But, you know, is it really causing you any problems? And then, of course, religions are often based on rituals. Uh, and many religions have a rich tradition of rituals, uh, particularly things like washing away sins. Uh, but you, so when you see this in OCD, you should ask yourself, is it unusual for the person's religion? Uh, is it really extreme compared to their cultural norms? And especially in a complicated place like America, you have to ask what kind of cultures are they actually exposed to. They could be part of, uh, of a subculture in America outside of the dominant culture. They may have cultural influences uh, that other people don't have. Just like we probably all have cultural influences that you know, the person next to you doesn't have. So, um, OCD, you know, when these things really rise to a level that's unusual in the culture and a problem for the person, um, 
think that part of this slide was supposed to be somewhere else. I told you about Tourette's already, and I told you that Tourette's is a developmental disorder from an outset in childhood. But there's significant crossover, again, between Tourette's and OCD. Um, the cognitive phenotype is very similar. They both have the same kinds of cognitive deficits as ADHD, this frontal executive deficits. And there's some evidence that there may be a common underlying genotype that can cause either, meaning things like cross heritability, like people who have OCD have relatives who have Tourette's and vice versa, even though these two are different. And, and one possible <coughs> explanation is maybe it's a, it's a, a sexual differentiation process, <coughs> like, like aspects of feminization may predispose to OCD and aspects of masculinization may predispose to tic disorders. Um, and it's also worth emphasizing that the neuropsych, the cognitive pictures of all these disorders are actually very similar, OCD, Tourette's, and ADHD. And sometimes these three are kind of clustered into a developmental triad. They all have frontal executive deficits. Although what's different is that ADHD is really just frontal executive deficits, potentially with a high activity level. In Tourette's, there are motor and vocal tics. And in OCD, there are obsessions and compulsions. Um, but they all have the same cognitive issues. And even FAS also has the same cognitive pattern. Um, autism even has a lot of frontal executive deficits, although depending on who is tested, you get some more complicated results. And in many parts of the autism population have broad deficits across um, uh, various aspects of cognition outside of frontal executive functions. Um, so frontal executive functions are a common theme. All these, essentially every disorder we've talked about so far has frontal executive deficits. And one thing we talked about is that they're vulnerable to insult. And there may be a sociobiological explanation for that. It is essentially a, um, a last in, first out kind of argument. Um, frontal executive processes are phylogenetically young, right? When we talked about some things that are phylogenetically old, like the circadian process, in contrast, Frontal executive functions are phylogenetically young, meaning if you compare us to our closest existing relatives, like the primate, other primates, we're obviously already vastly different in terms of our executive functions compared to primates. And primates are vastly different, um, like apes are vastly different than monkeys. And so, and then, so then by the time you get from us, say, to dogs or cats, the difference in executive functions is huge. So these developed late in the, in, this, in the the evolutionary scheme. <coughs> and those things that are late in the evolutionary scheme are going to be vulnerable to insult because they're essentially fine-tuning, right? Like, these things are mostly disorders that don't get you killed, right? They're things that you can survive. It makes sense that you would have an insult to these before you would have something like an insult to your ability to um, eat or sleep, things that would get you killed fairly quickly. Um, I want to mention a few more wrinkles uh, on some of this stuff. Um, so for OCD, <coughs> there is an interesting case. I don't know if the book uses this term, uh, but um, there are some interesting cases of OCD where the OCD dovetails an infectious disease. And that's called pediatric, that's called pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with streptococcus or PANDAS. Um, Pandas is a little controversial. Most people ex agree that there are cases of this. Where the disagreement comes in is how many OCD cases are pandas cases. And some people believe they all are, um, no matter how hard you look for and don't find the infection. And other people believe that this can occur in the absence of the infection. But what's happening is that during the infectious process, you see OCD behaviors. And then sometimes those OCD behaviors persist after the infection. Um, the symptoms mirror OCD. Uh, and they have, OCD is a basal ganglionic disease. It affects, the, it's a, there's an effect of the basal ganglia, which are part of frontal executive functions um, that have to do with selecting uh, and suppressing or enhancing behaviors. Um, and those same deficits are seen in pandas kids. Um, and interestingly, it occurs developmentally, just like OCD. Adult strep infections do not seem to cause pandas. Um, so here's a picture of that. Uh, and Here's the kid with an infection. And in the beginning, they have the infection, and their OCD is high. They start on antibiotics, and the OCD levels go down. Um, but the antibody titer, so when they're exposed to some new 
um, uh, infection just to see what's happening. It, pe it spikes, but then when that goes away, it goes down again because um, their, uh, their treatment levels are high again. And then, um, I'm sorry, make sure I explain this right. Um, so what's happening here is that you're using antibody treatment uh, to quell the infection. When you are putting that stuff in, the OCD gets high, but then as it does its job, uh, the infection goes down, the OCD goes down, but then each time you administer more of that stuff, it goes back up. Um, because uh, this is the kind of treatment where uh, the products kind of mirror the, the original streptococcus. Um, so, the most common <coughs> treatment mechanism for OCD is high dose SSRIs, uh, re serotonin reuptake inhibitors, is the same thing you use for depression. Um, however, uh, D-cycloserine is an NMDA receptor, NMD agonist, NMDA, again, uh, the learning, the long term potentiation receptor. And in conjunction with behavioral therapy, it appears to be beneficial in reducing OCD symptoms. Um, what might be happening there is that the NMDA receptor agonist is enhancing learning and the behavioral therapy is, um, is creating the new experiences. You're learning the new experiences and they're overwhelming the old experiences. Um, and in general with things like anxieties, part of what's going on is that you are constantly confronted with contrary data, right? Like with mood disorders, the same thing. If you say that your, your life sucks, which might be a global thought that you would have in the context of depression, how often do you actually go through an entire day where nothing good happens to you, right? How often do you go through an entire week where nothing good happens to you? That's relatively rare. But in depression, you're overlooking the fact that nice things happen to you, and every time something bad happens to you, you're overweighting it. So if you're using this NMDA receptor agonist, which is increasing learning, maybe spontaneously with the with um, even spontaneously without the treatment, you would see an increased response to those contrary pieces of data. Uh, but with the behavioral therapy, you see a substantial reduction in OCD behaviors. Um, just a few more slides. So, um, let me last talk about schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, I think, is in a different chapter in the book. But the reason I want to bring it up here is because a lot of people do think of schizophrenia as a neurodevelopmental disease. Um, it's characterized by three things. Positive symptoms, which is the one that, you know, if you ask people what schizophrenia is, they're going to name things like hallucinations and delusional thinking. Like seeing or hearing or feeling things that are not really there. Believing something that, uh, that other people would consider unusual or strange, uh, like, like communicating with you in a special way or believing you have a superpower. But there are also negative symptoms and cognitive symptoms. The negative symptoms are things like flattened affect, uh, meaning your emotional production is reduced, anhedonia, meaning you don't enjoy things, apathy, meaning you're not interested in things, um, and cognitive symptoms like psychomotor and learning problems and frontal executive kinds of issues. Uh, and actually, the well-established clinical course of schizophrenia is that the positive symptoms are actually the last thing that you see. Um, and the negative and the cognitive symptoms actually precede the positive symptoms. And in hindsight, people with schizophrenia are not cognitively behaviorally normal prior to psychosis. And so most people, many people believe that schizophrenia is actually the end result of a neurodevelopmental process, meaning it's not so much that you are at risk for developing schizophrenia and then wham, one day, you have a stressor that generates psychosis, it's more that you had it all along, but the positive symptoms don't come out until that psychotic break that happens later. Um, that neurodevelopmental process probably has genetic components. We talked about copy number variants earlier, and it probably also has prenatal environmental factors, like uh, the book mentions placental pathology, um, and then um, famously, the month that you're born in, uh, seems to affect your likelihood of developing schizophrenia, uh, which would argue strongly for some kind of environmental factor. Um, and here's a picture of that. And so the number of schizophrenia births per 10,000 live births, these are all very small numbers from 28 to 34. So it's not like 
being born in these summer months doubles or triples your chances of developing schizophrenia. And, and obviously, you know, I was born in April and I don't have schizophrenia, but the chances are higher uh, in these months and they're lower in these other months. And so counting nine months backwards um, from May would put you in the fall, right? So um, that um, uh, uh, the conception that happens uh, nine months prior to this range of dates uh, does increase chances of schizophrenia. Uh, and so that's another environmental factor that potentially explains schizophrenia. Um, dopamine is a really important uh, brain chemical to understand in schizophrenia, and most of the uh, early uh, uh, schizophrenia medications, antipsychotics, alternate dopamine. Um, and this time, there's too much dopamine, too much response to dopamine. Uh, and uh, so, um, with a dopamine challenge, schizophrenics produce more dopamine than controls. Um, and dopamine levels uh, are correlated with positive symptoms of schizophrenia with high dopamine creating <coughs> high levels. And in fact, in things like Parkinson's, where the dopamine levels are too low, uh, if you have if you over-administer dopamine to affect Parkinson's, you actually can produce psychosis. So that's a really brief look at schizophrenia. Um, again, I want to give kind of touch on some of these things and give you a taste for how some of what you've learned so far in the term applies to these disorders. Uh, the last one I want to mention really briefly is very different, um, which is neuroblastoma. So. Neuroblastoma is a kind of a neoplastic cancer disease. What happens here is that in infancy, during proliferation and migration, cluster of neural tissue migrates outside the nervous system and then becomes a tumor, usually by attaching to a peritoneal organ uh, like, uh, like the um, uh, uh, kidney. Um, and so this cluster of nervous tissue ends up somewhere else. It becomes a tumor. Um, it only happens developmentally because um, you don't have very much neuronal migration after this early phase. Remember, if I go all the way back to the beginning of today's lecture, um, neuronal migration uh, happens uh, mostly during the second trimester, but it's pretty much over by the time you're th two or three years old. And so neuroblastoma can only onset at those really young ages during the prenatal or early postnatal period. Um, and so it's obviously neurodevelopmental in nature. Um, typically, neuroblastomas arise from sympathetic nervous tissue in the peripheral nervous system, not in the brain. Uh, and often, they latch onto peritoneal organs. Um, neuroblastoma uh, it varies in severity. There's some really mild cases that um, spontaneous resolve. For the more severe cases, you really want to act on them early in life. Um, so that's just an example of a neurodevelopmental disorder that's not neurological or psychiatric, because the brain isn't impacted, because this tissue, by the time it's a problem, is somewhere else. Okay. Uh, 